This is chapter 25, part B. We're still dealing with the urinary system. Last time, uh, chapter 25, part A, ended with discussing the filtration that occurred within the glomerulus, and now we're moving on to the second step, which deals with tubular reabsorption. We're still going to be talking about the formation of the urine and how adjustments are made to it, where these adjustments are made. And just keep in mind, this is going to be focusing more on reabsorption and secretion. What you are going to be putting back into blood, what else is taken out of the blood. And some of this is going to depend on the current situation. What's the concentration within the blood right now? What are the activities that are going on right now, which change constantly? So if we first look at the second part, which is tubular reabsorption, step two, you have filtered most things out of the blood, as I said, in the glomerulus in that Bowman's capsule, and now you're moving into the tubular network. Um, Tubular reabsorption is going to take most of the uh, contents that's in that filtrate, which ultimately is going to form the urine, and most of it's going to be returned to the blood. So just about all of your organic nutrients are put back into the blood. Uh, so reabsorption you're taking out of this newly formed filtrate, like I said, is going to eventually form the urine, and you're moving stuff back into the blood. The water and various ions, reabsorption of those is going to be regulated by hormones. And that's where the adjustments depend on what's going on at this particular time. So how do things pass out of the tibules into the capillaries? They can go one of two routes, either transcellular or paracellular. The transcellular route means it's going to pass through the cells between uh, the cells that are lining that, the tibule, so the cells that are between the tibial and the, the capillaries. They're going to travel actually inside the cell, so they have to go out of the tube, inside the tibial cells, through the cytosol, exit out on the other side, which is going to be at the basolateral membrane, and then enter the blood. The paracellular uh, route means it's just going to be moving between the tibules. In this diagram, you can see the upper black lines are showing the transcellular, how it's moving out of that, uh, on the far left, the, the lumen, the open area where the filtrate is, and things such as some of the water and the solutes are going to, as you can see, go across that exposed apical membrane into the cytosol, past the whole distance of the cell, and then out the membrane on the other side, eventually then into the capillary. Versus the paracellular is moving between the cells, between some of those leaky uh, tight junctions. And then it moves into the, they both end up in the, the capillary. But it's just, what's the route that they take? Between the cells or through the cell? We're going to talk about this in some detail, but as you can see, starting on the left-hand side, you've got the proximal convoluted tibule. This is where most of the filtrate is going to be reabsorbed. You've got things such as water, your sodium, uh, as I said your organic compounds like glucose. Those are going to be reabsorbed back into the blood. At the same time, you have secretion occurring. Secretion is when substances that remained in the blood are going to be moving out of the blood into that uh, tibule for the formation of urine. Oftentimes things such as hydrogen ions, ammonium, certain drugs. As the filtrate moves down through the descending limb of the loop of Henle, oftentimes here you're going to have reabsorption of water occurring. It loops around on the ascending limb. You have things such as urea that are going uh, to be secreted out of the blood into the, the urine. As you continue on up, 
you have additional reabsorption of some of your ions, such as sodium, potassium, chlorine. And then as you enter into the distal convoluted tubule, you have more uh, reabsorption occurring of uh, the sodium, chlorine, calcium. This is now usually going to be regulated by hormones at this point. And then reabsorption and secretion will continue down the collecting duct. Once again, that is going to be regulated by hormones at that point. Some of the hormones, if you remember from the endocrine system, include things such as the aldosterone, which is going to be uh, playing a huge role when you're talking about the collecting ducts and then the distal uh, convoluted tibial. And playing a role, it tends to help um, with reabsorption of some of the sodium, potassium, water is going to uh, follow those. As you reabsorb that sodium, ultimately there should be very low sodium in urine. So most of it that initially was filtered out, it is now reabsorbed back into the, the blood. This is going to play a role in helping to regulate blood pressure and also um, decrease levels of potassium. The antidiuretic hormone, ADH, is certainly another hormone that plays a huge role uh, that's going to help increase with water reabsorption. If you increase the levels of the ADH, then you would increase the amount of water that's reabsorbed, leaving less water in the urine. Atrial natriuretic peptide helps to reduce the amount of sodium in the blood. This is going to result in decreased blood volume and decreased blood pressure. So this particular uh, compound it tends to be released when the blood volume is too high or the pressure is too high. Parathyroid hormone is <coughs> excuse me, also going to play a role in the distal convoluted tibial to help increase the amount of calcium that's being reabsorbed. <coughs> Secretion, as I said, is uh, basically substances moving out of the blood into the filtrate in the formation of urine. This occurs, uh, a lot of it occurs in the proximal convoluted tibial. You sometimes are moving substances into the filtrate depending on what's going on, like once again, uh, hydrogen ions, ammonia, potassium. Why are you moving additional substances out of the blood? You're trying to get rid of substances that you don't want uh, in the blood. Some things may have been kind of passively reabsorbed, but you, you really need to get rid of these, these waste products. Sometimes you're trying to get rid of drugs or various uh, compounds that bound to the proteins in the, the blood that, remember, proteins are do not filter out in the first step. So you're trying to get rid of this, basically waste products. It can also play a role in helping to control the blood pH. Remember, the pH is going to be very t closely monitored. And in the kidneys, which, remember, is where we're at, it's going to play a huge role in helping to maintain proper blood pH. So once again, this just shows... The blue is uh, boxes are showing the reabsorption, and the green is the secretion. Now, one thing that the kidneys are also going to do is is to help um, regulate the the volume and the concentration of the urine, and essentially what it's doing is regulating the amount of water loss. Um, and the concentration of various things that are dissolved in the urine. We're talking about what we call the osmotic concentration. You want to maintain the body fluid at a osmotic concentration at a certain level. You want it to be fairly stable. Now in the kidneys, there are areas where it changes quite a bit. If the body becomes dehydrated, 
what happens, you don't want to have even more water loss in the urine. And so what the kidneys are going to do is make adjustments and retain and try to reabsorb as much water as possible so that you're not losing it because you're already dehydrated. And the reverse is true if you're overhydrated. Then the kidneys are going to release more water in the urine. The urine is going to become even more dilute so that you can get rid of the excess fluid. There's a way that the kidneys are going to deal with this uh, change, which can occur obviously over time, go from dehydrated to overhydrated. Remember, the body wants to try to remember. Uh, maintain this this balance that homeostatic balance and not have these high swings so the kidneys are going to be making adjustments they do this by what we call a countercurrent mechanism basically it's where you have something that has a hairpin turn on it um, like a u-turn on it you can have fluid going in different basically directions and you can have interaction of what's flowing in the ascending or descending limb of the, the loop of Henle, um, the filtrate, you have interactions that are occurring. And this is going to be seen more in a moment in a picture where we see that um, you need to basically create this osmotic gradient, this, this pressure gradient, and then you want to preserve it. You don't want to change it. You create it and keep it that way. And then because of this gradient, then the collecting ducts utilize that gradient to alter the urine concentration. So if you look at this uh, diagram, as you can see, uh, starting at the top, where you have a, one of the um, juxtamedullary nephrons that extends down from the cortex down deep into the, the medulla, there is a chart that is showing the concentration of the solutes. We have a number there that, that is showing the pressure. As you are increasing the number of them, you are increasing the pressure, which means you're increasing the concentration of the solutes, the things that are dissolved in the water. So as that higher concentration, basically you have less water, higher solute concentration. So what we see with the... Um, in the nephron loop, they're going to create the gradient there. You're going to have water flowing out. If you have a set amount of volume and you have water flowing out, then that means you're concentrating the solutes. Because maybe initially, let's just say you had 100 mils of water and you had 5 grams of salt. If you remove some of that water, if you remove 75, 25 milliliters, so you're, you're left with 75 milliliters, but you still have the 5 grams of salt, that's now more concentrated. The pressure, osmotic pressure, is now higher. Now if you remove another 25 mils of water, so you're at 50 mils of water, still with 5 grams of salt, the, the concentration of those solutes per mill is higher now. You started with 5 grams per 100 mils, now you're 5 grams per 50 mils. So it's, it's much more concentrated and the osmotic um, pressure is higher just by removing that water. So the nephron loop, that loop of Henle helps to create this gradient. The vasorecta on the capillaries, paratibial capillaries that are surrounding these tibules, they help to preserve that gradient. And then the collecting ducts are going to use that gradient to adjust the urine concentration. So in this picture, as you can see the loop of Henle, uh, the Filtrate as it is flowing down, it flows down the descending limb and then up the ascending limb. Well, they're flowing in different directions. That's why we call it countercurrent. The descending limb is very permeable to water, so it's allowing the water, just by passive transport, to move out. And then the ascending limb is impermeable to water, 
So it's not allowing the water to flow. But now it's allowing, you have the movement of sodium chlorine, which is a salt, out. So you have this difference that's occurring. So water leaves as the, the filtrate. You're forming the urine as it's coming down the descending loop. Water is leaving. As you can see in the bottom picture, the blue arrows are showing that the water is leaving the filtrate. It's going to move and go back into the interstitial fluid, back into the blood and the via. Remember, these tibials are wrapped with the paratibial capillaries. So the water is moving out of the filtrate, out of what's going to be the urine, back into towards the blood. As you move around, the pressure is highest at the very bottom of the loop. Now as you make the turn and come up the ascending limb, now you are removing sodium chloride. It's being pumped out of that filtrate. As it's being filtered, uh, pumped out of the filtrate, the pressure now is decreasing. So it's like you had that 5 grams of salt in the 50 mils at the bottom. I took, four, uh, I took 1 gram of salt out. Still have 50 mils. I took another gram of salt out as we move halfway up. By the time we get to the top, I may be left um, with only one gram of salt in 50 mils. I started with five. So you're removing that sodium chloride out. This is showing, <coughs> excuse me, once again, how the vas erecta, this is the capillaries that are surrounding the tibules. They are able to reabsorb some of the water in the solutes move things back and forth within, depending on what the needs are. And once again, you have a counter current flow because of that hairpin loop in there. In terms of the medullary osmotic gradient, remember the loop of Henle extends down into the medulla area of the kidney. The urea is helping to form a gradient here. Uh, it enters the filtrate in that ascending limb of the nephron. And in the cortical uh, collecting duct, it reabsorbs water and it's going to leave the urea behind. Um, so you are now also contributing to gradients unnecessary. In terms of what chemicals may have some influence in the production of urine, ADH, your antidiuretic hormone, is going to help uh, increase with water reabsorption, so you have less water in the urine. Something that's going to inhibit that hormone is going to be alcohol, which is one of the reasons why if you drink excessive amounts of alcohol, why does it seem that you have to go pee a lot is because, yes, the water is being retained in the urine, and so you are going to have to release that. Sodium reabsorption inhibitors um, such as caffeine and some drugs um, will interfere and can also increase the amount of urinary output. Some drugs that are used for uh, treating hypertension or high blood pressure, this is one way that they work. It's that they essentially are a diuretic. They will increase the, the urine output. Uh, certain substances that are not going to be reabsorbed, so they remain uh, or cause water to remain in the urine. <clears throat> this one thing can be uh, glucose. If there's high glucose concentrations, it tends to pull some of that water from the body and increase the amount of urine production. You, This is one, uh, you wouldn't call it a side effect, but one of the symptoms of a di diabetics. In terms of evaluating how well the kidneys are functioning, you can do urinalysis, which is chemical uh, testing of the urine. You can also use this to test for illegal substances. 
If you want to uh, just test for certain signs of disease, sometimes you may just need a urine sample. For overall testing of renal function, you may also need to do a blood test as well. If you're looking at renal clearance, you're looking at the volume uh, of plasma that the kidneys can uh, process within a certain amount of time. You can run tests for this. What would you be testing or indicating from the results of this? You're trying to look to see is there glomular damage, is there renal disease? Chronic renal disease is defined when for three months you have, uh, so you have consistently uh, less than 60 millimeters per minute running through. Um, if the filtrate amount is decreasing, what happens is you typically are going to have, especially like nitrogenous waste building up in the blood, the pH of the blood may be decreasing so it's too acidic. This sometimes is seen with diabetes mellitus and uh, hypertension. Renal failure is defined when it's less than 15 milliliters per minute. Um, what are causes of this? Hormonal imbalances, metabolic abnormalities. What are symptoms going to be? Cramps, uh, nausea, fatigue. You may see some mental uh, changes that are occurring. What's the treatment? You need to go on uh, dialysis and possibly on transplant. Typically uh, speaking, number one, you don't need both kidneys for survival. You can survive on just one kidney. Usually when these numbers get down to about 17 is when they're going to say you need to go on dialysis. And discussion is going to be whether you need kidney transplant. Urine, the chemical composition, it's mostly water. It does have some solutes in it. It's going to contain uh, nitrogenous waste such as uric acid, urea, creatine. Typically, you will find some levels of sodium, potassium, maybe calcium in there. If you have abnormally high levels, um, that's going to be raise some concern what's going on. And you should not have proteins. You should not have white blood cells. You should not have uh, bile pigmentations in there. That would be more indicative that um, there is some disorder or disease infection going on. This table shows a list of different substances that if are found in the urine would be abnormal, what the name of that condition would be, and what some possible causes of it would be. In terms of the urine, what's uh, some of the physical characteristics? It sh should be clear. If it is cloudy, that would be indicative of a urinary tract infection. Bacteria, when they grow, whatever they're growing in, tends to turn cloudy. So uh, if the urine is cloudy, that would lead you to think that an individual has a UTI, urinary tract infection. It should be some shade of yellow from pale to a deep yellow. If it's pale, you're usually uh, normal to very uh, diluted urine is pale. If it's uh, very concentrated, it, the yellow gets a darker color, um, or the urine gets a darker color. The yellow is due to the pigment urochrome. Obviously, if it's some other color, it can be caused by eating certain foods, having certain uh, drugs, or possibly if it's pink, it might have blood in it. The odor is slightly aromatic. If it has been sitting for a while, you can have definitely an ammonia odor to it because of the bacteria that would be growing and it could metabolize the urea. Certain diseases you may find um, kind of cause distinctive or unique smells to the urine, and that can help you with diagnoses. The pH should be slightly acidic. Um, now, depending on an individual's diet, 
or conditions like if someone has had prolonged vomiting that may increase the pH. Specific gravities of water is one. Because urine is mostly water but does have solutes in it, the specific gravity should be slightly higher than one. The ureters are going to be obviously attached to the kidneys and it's a tube that's going to connect the kidney to the bladder so that the urine that has been formed in the kidney can then drain and be stored in the bladder. There's three different layers of the ureter wall. When you start from the innermost, you've got the mucosa and then the muscularis, which is smooth muscle. Um, even though the kidneys are above the bladder, gravity alone is not going to allow the urine to, to just flow freely from the kidneys down to the bladder. There has to be a little bit of uh, peristaltic uh, contractions to help move. So that's going to be the muscularis layer that's doing that. And then the adventitious, the outermost uh, connective tissue, is fibrous connective tissue on the outside. So this view is showing you the three different layers. The innermost purple layer, as you can see, is the mucosa, kind of the turquoise bluish layer is the muscularis, and then the adventition on the outermost. If kidney stones are formed, um, typically they're going to be in the renal pubis. It's oftentimes calcium or magnesium or uric acid salts. They, if they're large enough, they can actually block the, in the renal pelvis, the opening uh, to the ureter, and that's going to be painful because then the urine cannot flow out. Uh, sometimes if you have chronic infections, it can cause this. Treatment is non-invasive. Basically, essentially what they're doing is sending shock waves to break up the stones small enough so then they can pass. The urinary bladder is essentially a muscular sac. It's a storage uh, a site for the urine until it is released from the body. In the males, the uh, Prostate gland is going to be behind the, the bladder. In females, the uh, bladder is going to be in front of the vag your vagina, and then the uterus is kind of sitting behind and on top of the bladder. The bladder's got uh, an area called the trigonal area that has three openings. You have a ureter coming in from both the kidneys, and then you have the urethra. The layers of the bladder wall, you've got the mucosa, then you have the muscular layer, and then the fibrous adventitia on the outermost. This is showing in the male, the trigon area, and then how the urethra leaving the bladder is going to go through. Now the male, we refer to different sections of the urethra by different names. The prosthetic urethra is going through the prostate gland. Then it is going to uh, move to eventually the spongy urethra, which is the portion that is going through the penis. In the female, we just use the term urethra, and you may notice that it is much shorter than the urethra in the males. The bladder tends to kind of collapse when it's empty, and you see the rugae, those uh, it almost looks kind of like ridges, similar to what you saw in the stomach, and this allows it to expand as it fills. Um, a full bladder can hold roughly about one pint. It can hold more than that. The problem is it, if it becomes too distended, it could burst, um, and then also have issues if it does not burst, if it's overly distended, returning when it empties back uh, down to the possible size. The urethra is that tube that does drain the bladder to the external um, environment. There are two sphincters involved, the internal urethral sphincter, which is involuntary uh, smooth muscle, 
And then the external urethra sphincter, which is skeletal muscle, so you have voluntary control on that. In females, the urethra is only about three to four centimeters. Um, in males, as I said, it goes through uh, different regions. We have different names, the prosthetic urethra, the membranous urethra, and then the spongy urethra. And overall combined, it's about 19 to 20 centimeters uh, in length. So once again, showing the length comparisons. And the reason I'm showing you the length comparisons and mentioning this is that um, in bladder infections, uh, urinary tract infections, are more common in females than they are in males. And the reason for that, part of the reason for that is because the urethra is so much uh, shorter in females than males. In females, the shorter distance, if there is improper habits um, of wiping, you should wipe from front to back so that you do not take a chance of introducing fecal bacteria into the urethra but if it's done improperly, the fecal bacteria, basically, there's not much distance to have to travel up the urethra and get into the bladder. Uh, so urinary tract infections are more common in females, uh, oftentimes in young little girls who are just learning uh, to be potty trained, must be taught correctly how to wipe. And sometimes the elderly women, old, you know, they revert back. That's uh, just not using proper uh, toilet habits. Inflammation of the urethra is urethritis. Cystitis is inflammation of the bladder. Pyelitis is inflammation of the kidney. So we do distinguish where the the urinary tract infection is by specifically those terms. Um, general term would just be UTI. What are some of the symptoms? Usually painful urination, uh, increased frequency in having maybe less urine being released each time you do go, fever. Sometimes there may be some blood in the urine. It may be slightly cloudy. If the kidneys are involved, there's usually uh, pain in the lower back. Antibiotics are very uh, successful for treating most of your urinary tract infections because usually it's caused by bacteria. Urination or voiding or micturition, there's got to be three different events that have to occur. First, you have to have the detrusor uh, muscle contract. Then you have to have the internal urethral sphincter open up. Both of those are involuntary. And then the voluntary muscle, the external urethral sphincter, is the last one that must open up to allow for the passage of the urine. Urinary incontinence uh, in adults usually is caused by weak pelvic muscles. There can be stress incontinence, which uh, you have increased pressure in the abdomen that tends to force urine through the external sphincter. Oftentimes this is with coughing or laughing or sneezing. Overflow incontinence is when urine um, is little drops of release, basically when the bladder is overfilled. Urinary retention is when the bladder is unable to expel that uh, urine. How come uh, this is occurring? It could be a couple of causes. For everyone, usually when you've been under general anesthesia, it can affect the bladder's ability to expel that urine. And what they will do is oftentimes uh, have the patient catheterized. After surgery, once you have come out of the general anesthesia, you'll be monitored when they remove the catheter, they're going to want to make sure that you are completely um, expelling the urine, draining that bladder before you're released. Otherwise, they may have to leave a catheter in longer. 
from a microbiology standpoint, you want that catheter in for as little time as possible because the longer it's in, you increase risk for uh, UTIs. In males, if the prostate gland, which is below the bladder and the urethra, remember, passes through it, there is an increased uh, problem when that prostate gland becomes inflamed. It causes uh, constriction of the urethra, and so you have an increased problem of retention of urine in the bladder, which is why one of the symptoms for inflamed or enlarged prostate gland with the meal is more frequent urination and less urine being released each time. Uh, just kind of FYI, you would want to follow up on that and make sure, uh, basically look at what is the cause of the enlarged prostate gland. You want to make sure that it is not cancer.